I want to get you guys started. Um, let's. The first place to go is this sptethereum.io. Um, I've done my best. There's lots more to write. I owe the world a lot of a, a lot more. Um, let's make it a little bit bigger. A lot more stuff. Um, but you can see all of those commands. <laughs> see, we were looking at the eth node commands, right? They're all documented here, eth node chain ID, eth node URL, that we looked at before. Um, a thing that I want to point out, because it's sort of a shitty user interface on my part, it's not obvious, but it's really important and helpful, is that down here in the bottom left corner is a page table of contents. So when I switch, um, you'll see that this bottom part switch, switches to. And you can find out about, about aliases, for example. One of the patterns of um, SBT Ethereum is it asks you to give human-friendly aliases for almost everything. Right? So as you're trying to use this as a reference, um, you can you know, <coughs> learn about a command by using the, ta the page table of contents. Um, all of the commands are documented. Um, but like most humans, nobody wants to spend a lot of time reading the manual. The idea is that it should be easy to get started, and when you run into something, you should be able to figure out how to read the manual. So let's try to get started. Um, I'm going to do something that I think is fun, and we'll see whether or not I make a fool of myself. Um, I usually do, but I, that's only accurate. Um, So what I want to do is become you. So I'm going to delete this thing called temp user and create a new user. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is, now I'm a fresh user. Okay, I have a Java virtual machine. This user is showing a Java 11 virtual machine. My main user is still on a Java 8 one, but either one should work. So the only things that I have on, in my world as a new user are what hopefully you guys have, which is a Java virtual machine, and you should have Git. And so we're going to get started. I'm going to walk you through this first part just the same way as in the getting started tutorial of the docs, right? So if you get lost or you want to try this at home or whatever, um, it should be pretty easy. We are just going to do this git clone command just to make sure that we're working with the current version. We can use the branch modifier. You don't really need to, but... And... If you're following along, I encourage you to follow along. Please try to do this. So it's at SBT Ethereum. I'm, before I hit return, I'm going to get you back. SBT Ethereum, SBT-Ethereum.io, the getting started tutorial. Just copy this line, um, and you will get this directory. So I'm going to hit return. So exciting. I now have a new directory called eth command line. Um, okay. Now, as long as you are on a Unix-like machine, Linux or Mac, that's all you need. The other thing you need is a software called SBT, but eth command line has embedded in it a little wrapper script that will launch SBT for you and auto-download it. If you're on Windows, you'll probably need to download and install SPT separately because um, this is a bash script. It won't work. Okay, so if you're following along at home, I hope that you are, um, then just CD into that one and type SPTW 
and magic things will hopefully start to happen. Magic things is a lot of downloading of crap. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I have an issue with the version. Like, mm -hmm. Here, let me see. So please do. Like this is this is not the workshop section. I'm no longer the asshole. I'm still an asshole, but <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just going through this together. So let's see what's going on. So if things worked out, you should get to the point where SPT starts asking you questions. SPT is chatty, SPT Ethereum is chatty and interactive. <clears throat> Has anybody gotten to this or no? I won't go on until I know that at least somebody is here. No, so I'll walk around and kind of see where you guys are. Okay, let's, let's see. No, it's behaving all right in my world. That. And that address you want to copy and paste. Once you're there, the command that the set of commands that broke still won't work. I really apologize for that. Um, I've been chasing down and trying to improve the parsers and chasing down problems, but um, I did not run it fresh since I modified it and um, I broke. So the eth key store v3 validate command is currently not working. Um, even when you have the right names. This stuff here is a parser error. But I think everything else should broadly work because I have been messing around with this for the last 12 hours and it does work. So if you, that will be fixed by tomorrow if you check out 3.13. I'm really embarrassed about it. Um, but I'd love for you to put up with it. And um, so what you want to do, you do need a default sender. So again, you need to quit SBT Ethereum. You can do that. Um, by pressing Control D is the easiest way, and the input. I think you can type quit too, um, or exit or something. Uh, um, so no, Control D, and the input like that. Um, so if you saw the error, you should have seen the error. This stuff is. Uh, very reproducible. I should have reproduced it and done a dry run um, to see this with a fresh command line. Um, but so you want to get out of it and then rerun it. It'll open up just fine. It did make an address for you. So to find that address, you do eth key store list. When you do eth key store list, it won't say default sender yet because the break happened when it was trying to solicit whether or not it wanted you to automatically set up a default sender. So SPT Ethereum tries to walk you through this setup process in a seamless way. Today it is horrendously failing. Um, so I really apologize for that. Um, if you want to see how it's supposed to be, you can look at the tutorial. It's supposed to just ask you if you want it to be the default sender. Um, and it and goes from there. Um, but I didn't see this error because I didn't run it as a new user um, since I've modified it unfortunately and I don't have I don't have testing good enough to catch all these interact all these interactive kinds of problems um, so once you have your address shown you need to set a default sender address um, so that's eth address sender default set again it's a Mouthful, it's a long way to go. I might have made it a little bit easier, nope. So like that, and then just copy that hex address. 
and then it will become your default address. And you will be able to see that by typing ETH, which will show you that the, act, the active session sender. All right, so for those of you who have managed to follow along and put up with this a little bit, um, you should be at a command line like this. If you do ETH key store list, you should be able to see stuff work. The next thing that we want to do, so our task for today is to interact with this smart contract. Um, here. Um, so in order to do that, we are going to need um, its ABI. Right? So for any smart contract that's on the Ethereum blockchain, there's this piece of JSON, which is a description of how it works. So how do we get the ABI? Well, usually, if there's smart contracts, if you compile your own smart contract, you get the ABI automatically. And if you compile and deploy your own smart contract with SBT Ethereum, you don't ever have to worry about it. SBT Ethereum automatically saves and remembers it for you. Um, but in this case, this is a smart contract that's deployed on the Ethereum network that you've never worked with before, but you'd like to work with now. Um, so the easiest way to do that is to take the address, copy that address, and go to the website called Etherscan, which is a little bit too centralized for any of our tastes, but it is the place where people tend to publish information about their contracts. So this contract has been verified on Etherscan. Um, and you'll find, if you scroll down, here's the ABI, and there's even a handy thing to let you copy the ABI. So how do you get to this page? So, um, so it's etherscan.io. The tricky thing, though, to get to this page was this address, right? So if you go, I sent you guys this link somewhere, but it's, my, it's on GitHub. Swaldman slash ethquip client, and then there's an issue, which is this workshop. And then you can find the address. And so if you search for that address, <laughs> um, goodness. Um, if so, if you search for that address on Etherscan, you'll get to here. Um, and then if you go into contract, right, and then if you scroll down, you can see there's this link here, you can copy the ABI. Now on SBT Ethereum, the command that you want is called ETH contract ABI import. Import commands like they sound are ways to import stuff into your database. They're usually interactive. Oh, this one wants the address. So I'm going to um, copy that address. Again, that was this address. So if I hit tab, it's asking me for an address, hex. There's the address. Um, now, if I had had an Etherscan key set up, it would take it automatically. I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but you guys probably don't have an Etherscan key set up. So this should be what you see right here. So you're going to have to paste the ABI. So you go to that Etherscan. You copy it from here. Copy the clip clipboard, OK and then paste it, and then you should have the ABI. Now, it's asking you, let's see if I haven't messed this up, but it's asking you now, SBT Ethereum always wants you when it gets something like this, whether it's a hex address or an ABI or uh, anything that is hard for humans to deal with, um, it wants you to try to give an alias to this. This is going to be an alias for the address. So let's call that quip. Right? So now, if you can get through this set of commands, you have everything you need to be able to interact with the quip contract. So I'm going to do ETH transaction view. We'll come back to why it's ETH transaction view in just a minute, but I just want to show you this. ETH transaction view quip. And then I hit tab. 
and I have all of these commands. Now, if I do get quip, okay, so that's a method of that smart contract. Maybe it needs an argument. I hit tab. It needs an I of type uint. Okay, so it wants some kind of an index. I'm going to give it zero since that's the most likely for there to be something there. And voila, I've interacted with the smart contract and gotten a quip from it. So let me see. I'm going to walk around for those of you who are following along. And see. Um, So again, I'm very grateful to all of you following along and going through. And those of you who are sort of having problems or following behind, I'm here as long as anybody wants to stay and we'll walk you through it. Um, but there are two ways of interacting with a smart contract. The one that we have done right here, ETH transaction view. Um, here, let's do a random quip. Um, is it reading from the blockchain. Anybody can read from the blockchain for free at any time. But the other thing you want to do with a blockchain is, the do thing, is do things that change the blockchain and maybe manipulate value or things like that. So in Ethereum, those two operations are quite distinct. Reading from the blockchain is free, but writing to the blockchain requires submitting a transaction. So that's ETH transaction invoke. And if I do the same thing that we've done before, ETH transaction invoke and then quit, You'll see that we have all those methods we had before, but we also have some new methods like add quip, payout, um, and vote. Those methods weren't there before. Now, if I try this right now, I can do add quip, and it will ask me for a quip of type string. I can type strings as single quoted strings or double quoted strings, it doesn't matter. I say, this is a dumb quip. I wouldn't want to say that if it was going to work um, and try to come up with something cleverer. But what's going to happen? Okay, so it asks me right now, I'm going to submit a transaction now to the Ethereum blockchain, right? This is a big deal. Money could be involved. Anything could happen. So if I do each transaction invoke, unlike with Vue, it asks me whether I'm cool with signing a transaction. Right, so who's signing the transaction? Well, that default sender address that we set up, not very easily, unfortunately, because of my broken parser. Um, but that default sender, if you look at who the from is, it's that default sender that you set up. Um, it's telling us what we're doing. We're sending some data, what that data means. When it, when it knows that, it will tell you that. And then it's asking us whether or not we want to sign it. It's also telling us how much it's going to cost. It's going to cost 92,977 units of gas, right? So in Ethereum, when you want to submit a transaction, you're asking the network to do computation for you, and you have to pay for it in units of gas. But gas has a price, right? So the current gas price it's saying is that I would pay 2.52 gigaway for each unit of gas, and at the current price, that would amount to about four cents. So for now, I'm going to presume that's OK and say yes, but watch what's going to happen. No, nope, I still have to unlock this. OK, and it says insufficient funds, right? Because this is a brand new address, and I have no money in it. So I can't actually change the state of the blockchain. So um, if you go to this issues page here that I set up where you stole the address from. My clever idea for how to deal with this is to ask you guys to cut and paste your addresses that you just made, that you've set up as your default senders, into this page, and I will give you some real money okay. so that you can try running transactions on the blockchain, not just reading from it. Um, so please do. It's this Swaldman ETHQuip client, um, and then if you go to the issues page, there's only one issue, and if you start adding some Ethereum addresses, I will give you a little bit of money, and then you can play. Command, and that one, this one's called EtherSend, and so Gary Job, whoever you are, I love you, 
Um, <laughs> I am going to, I love you so much. I am going to send you some ether. Um, so I'm going to send you 0 0.01 ether, right? So it's ETH transaction ether. So I'm going to lift this up so you guys can see the command for just sending ether. ETH transaction ether send. Um, and, right, it's telling me how much it's going to cost. It's about a buck 83. Okay, so now after I've submitted a transaction, right, unlike viewing, which happens immediately, when we read from the blockchain, we read immediately. When we write to the blockchain, all we can do is submit a transaction, right, and then we gotta wait for one of those nodes on the blockchain to pick up our transaction and mine it into the blockchain. So that's what we're doing. We're gonna wait for up to five minutes. Now, I didn't check this. We're paying 1.1 gig away of, oh, okay, that happened fast enough. Um, so there you go. One thing it's worth knowing about if you don't, there's a site called ethgasstation.info, and it shows you basically kind of what the going price of gas is. Like if you, if you, you know, that sort of standard level is probably fine. And it's saying 1.1, which is exactly what we picked up as a default value. Um, but it's sometimes a good idea to, to check that the default value that it picks up is reasonable. It should be. It can fluctuate quite frequently, so it could be different. It's hopefully, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't want to make people too paranoid. I mean, usually it just works out at the default price that the node offers as the current gas price. Usually it works out, but. So, yeah, one thing SBT Ethereum does, if you want to just kind of be sure without having to sit around and look at ETH gas station all the time, so I'll do this. So ETH, um, so the command is ETH transaction gas price override, and I can just hit enter for this one. It's the same as override set. Now, I could set my own gas, enter a fixed amount, or hit enter to specify a dynamic markup. What I like to do if I'm worried, like if I'm giving a presentation and I don't want to make more of a ridiculous fool of myself than I already have and I want to make sure that my transactions are mined quickly, I can do something like this. I just say, you know what, whatever the default price is, give it a 50% markup. And then if I'm worried about it, I can set a cap for it, but I don't, or a floor. I'm still going to have an option with every transaction to check it to make sure I'm not paying more than I'm willing to pay. So let's, so, so, um, you will not overpay, you will pay, uh, as you're supposed to pay, it's just you, you, you set kind of your maximum high so that you can Well, so th that's true for gas limit. For gas limit, you won't only overpay, you'll only pay the amount that you use. For gas price, the price you set is the price you'll pay, right? So I've made my transaction cost 50% higher. So, Adrian, let's give Adrian some money. So, no, it's, it's crucial that they don't, right? So the idea is that gas is, is fixed by the contract, basically. Once you've written the code, it's sort of how many instructions are in the code. But in order to make Ethereum work, it's got to be possible for when demand is very high, you've got to have some way of deciding what transactions get mined. Right, so there's got to be an auction on the gas price. So, so you're exchanging ether for gas and using gas to execute your contract. Yes, so you give it the price, of how much gas you're using and the price of gas. Um, so here, I'm going to do this ether send, and this is going to be to the lovely Adrian Peng. And I'm also going to send 0.01 ether, like that, and we'll see. Right, notice it warns me that there's a gas price override set, the default gas price plus a market markup of 50%, not subject to any cap or floor. And we can see that what that came out to is instead of paying about one gig away, I'm paying 1.5 gig away per unit of gas. Um, it's still cheap for just sending ether, I don't care. I'm going to send the transaction. Yeah, no, I, I didn't have to set that override at 50%. And so I'm going to, you know, actually drop it now. I don't think I really need it. 
So that's ETH transaction gas price override and drop. Right? <laughs> and now, so and I could have, when I set that before, I'm going to set it again just so that you guys can see this. If I, if I set that override again to 50%, and I type ETH, ETH will tell me everything about my current session, right? A gas price override remains set for this chain, 50%. But then if I go drop the override and I type ETH again, we'll see again, right? And it, when you type ETH, if you're on a network, it will tell you the default gas price, what it currently is, with a big warning, this may change at any time. Um, and then so before, I had a 50% markup, so the actual price I was agreeing to was 1.5 gig away. But now with the markup gone, the gas price is just one gig away. Right? So it's a trade-off that you make in terms of certainty of fast execution versus price. But you are going to pay the price. It's, you're, not, you're not offering, it's, it's not like the maximum price you'd be willing to pay in an auction. It's you set the price, and then if the miner accepts it, you pay it. Yep. So, um, okay. So now that we are able to, so anybody else who gets this far, I'm going to, oh, look, we have... Adinju and Cave Painting. You guys are awesome. I'm so excited. Um, hey, AJ. I'm really excited that so many of you have gotten this far. I am so happy to give you money. <laughs> if you want the balance of any address anywhere in the, Ether, in the Ethereum blockchain, it's just ETH address balance and then give it the address, the hex address or an alias. So, okay, this one is finally mined. 78 seconds with its 50% markup. Um, so I can do, you know, like that fair win, ETH address balance, right? So you can see this address that I'm paying you out from has like 123 bucks in it, 0.67 Ether. Um, that fair win contract that's using up so much gas, let's see what it has. Oh, it has zero Ether. That's interesting. Um, let's look at what's something that's likely to have a good Ether balance. Um, Anything interesting here? I don't know. Um, Dutch X have ether? No, nope, I don't know. Um, yes, you can check the balance of any wallet. So all wallets, their balances are not fully public. <laughs> yep. Um, so let's see. So anyway, so I have paid money to. Edienju, this is AJ. Let me do this before I forget. Um, and then, so those of you who now have Ether, you can you can do the exciting thing that was our goal in this exercise. And um, and. Um, Start to, if you can, add a quip. Um, and then also, we're going to want to vote. Now that turns out to be a little bit more annoying, and that'll bring us to a command line interfaces. But if you can, if you haven't already, try to um, add quips. I'm going to, once this finishes, I'll see where you guys are, how many quips that we have. That's awesome. How do you uh, get the passphrase of your Coinbase wallet? The passphrase of your Coinbase wallet? Uh, so yeah, if it's just a Coinbase, like Coinbase will give you an address that you can get paid into, um, but they keep the keys. You don't have any control over it. If you have your own wallet from any other thing, um, you can import it, right? So. For SPT Ethereum, if you want to use your addresses that you're already using, yeah. it's ETH key store, and then from, and you can import either from a JSON wallet, there's a standard V3 JSON wallet for Ethereum, or from a private key. Um, you can import any Ethereum address that you have control over. But, a, you know, your Coinbase wallet or something, they keep the keys. There's nothing you can do with it unless you can get them to give them back to you. So if you have money in Coinbase, the thing to do is just make a wallet here, 
and send some money, withdraw some money from Coinbase to that address. Oh, just like write it. I see. Yeah, you just send it from, you know, so that's how last night I so excitingly on Coinbase purchased my very first die. So if I do ERC20 balance die, you can see I have an exciting 27 die. Right, so how did I get that? I bought it on Coinbase, and then I withdrew it to this address, which is this address here. Right, I just pasted in this address as a destination to withdraw the die to, and they sent it, and now I have it here. So, how can you do a DRT721? So you can do any of them from their contracts. So I, I haven't I haven't done a um, I haven't done any kind of wrap ERC seven twenty one I think is is the non fungible tokens right mm -hmm. so you probably can interact with those directly from the contract relatively straightforwardly because they don't have this issue of when you mean to send one token you actually need to send ten to the eighteenth or ten to the something tokens so that's the only real reason why I had to write a little wrapper for ERC twenty contracts. Um, I haven't messed around with the non-fungible tokens enough to know how convenient or inconvenient it is to use it directly from the smart. If we pick one, right? What's in it? So, like the Orbit Azimuth is actually one. I think ETH transaction invoke Orbit Azimuth, and if I hit Tab, I can see all of the methods on here. Um, uh, points activate point. It's there are a lot of them. Um, if we know an example of, do you know an example of a ERC721 token you're interested in? I don't think I like CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties? Let's see if we can find that. I haven't done that. That seems like a fun thing to do. So, you know, the great thing, I mean, of course I will say everything is great. It's not fucking software. Um, but one thing that I think is pretty great about this software is that as long as you can find the address of a thing and they have published their contract, you can start messing around with it. So here's CryptoKitties. Here's the contract for CryptoKitties. Um, they do have the contract verified. I'm going to just take this address and do the same thing that you guys did earlier. It's going to be ETH contract ABI import and that address. Now, in my main environment, not the fresh one I created, I have an Etherscan key set up for this address. Um, so I am going to um, say yes, I want to import the ABI from Etherscan. There it is. I'm going to use the ABI. I'm going to give this the name CryptoKitties. And now I can do ETH transaction invoke CryptoKitties and hit tab. And these are all the methods on their contract. And usually you want to start out before you start invoking crap with view, with the read only methods. So this will be a smaller number of methods, but they're methods that I can call without worrying about paying money. Um, and, you know, what can I look at here that's interesting? I mean, it's very exciting. <laughs> Pregnant kitties or something, but... So we hit tab again. Okay, it doesn't look like it wants arguments, pregnant kitties. Let's try it. Oh, here we go. There are 903 pregnant kitties, I guess. Wow. All right. So, um, you know, you can just start playing with these things really fast. So I really do encourage you to do, you know, if you sign into Etherscan, and then it's Etherscan... Etherscan API key um, set, and then you paste in the key that Etherscan gives you. Then you don't have to do the like go to Etherscan, copy the API, paste it. Just figure out what the address is. If it's a verified contract on Etherscan, you know, you just say why and it'll get imported. So, you know, pretty much whenever I hear of an Ethereum contract out there that's interesting, I bring it in here and I just start messing, you know, messing with it. With ETH transaction view, with the read-only stuff, um, you know, you can mess with everything without fear. Nothing happens. You're just messing around. 
There's also a version called ETH transaction mock, which like ETH transaction view doesn't actually change the blockchain, but will let you run the methods that are modifiers to simulate them and see what the result would be. So it doesn't change the blockchain, um, but you get the return value from the method. So there are three different ways of interacting with smart contract methods. ETH transaction invoke is how you actually send a transaction, ETH transaction view is read-only, methods only, and ETH transaction mock will let you simulate any method. It's actually the same underlying thing as ETH transaction view, um, but it allows you to work with. So if I have an existing wallet with Fastface, uh, how do I access that? So if you have a wallet, if it's, if it's in the format that's the standard JSON format, then all you have to do is Open the wallet, you don't need to know the pass, I mean, you don't, you'll need the passphrase to open it, but to import it, you don't need it. It's ETH key store from JSON import. And then hit return, it will ask you to paste in the JSON. And then you'll have it. Um, here, I can do that, just as an example. Um, so if I, um, Oh, I gotta get out of this before I start catting things. Um, this is where SBT Ethereum creates its keys and databases and stuff. Uh, let's take one of these early ones. Um, one that I recognize, that's what I'm looking for. This one, okay. Are you impressed what you recognize um, Yeah, so this is May 15th, 2018, 2008, 05, and um, 4047. <coughs> Oh, fuck it. I'm just going to do this. I think it's probably easier than trying to tab through it to those old ones. Um, so if I cat this, oh, I got to cat it in its right directory. Okay, this is what a JSON wallet looks like. Um, and if I go right in here, this is my fresh one that I was playing along with you guys. There's only one um, address in here. If I do ETH key store from JSON import, and then I paste this guy in, um, I will call this what I usually call it. So I'm going to guess I want an alias. I'm going to call it testing zero. Now if I do that ETH key store list again, I have this and I can do oh, ETH address ETH address balance um, and testing zero. Right, and this is the address that I sent you so, your money from. It is forever on the Ethereum block. Let's see where we're, we are where we are with quips. So we have ETH transaction view quip, um, and we can do quip count. We have nine, so I am excited, you guys, because there were there were only three when I did that yesterday. Now we're going to start seeing what's kind of annoying. Um, so to look at it, it's get quip, and so I can do zero, and I can do one, two, three, and so on. But this is kind of annoying. So this is where you kind of start thinking that you might like to write a little CLI. So I have done that. It's, um, I go to here, development. So basically the, uh 
references a specific block on the blockchain. So when you like go iterate through your reading from the block, right? uh, No, it doesn't reference a block on the blockchain. It's part of the state of the blockchain, right? So the quip contract has an address, and that address has state. And that state is written in the blockchain. The blocks construct the state, right? It's like the, the blockchain is a set of instructions. Okay. And as you go through the instructions, it modifies the state. But the quip contract is part of the state. And all of the quips that you guys have put in are now indelibly a part of the state. They will be on. No, this is not a test. This, this is real. If you, you know, if you put in some illegal information as a quip, wow. right? It's censorship yeah, resistance. <laughs> right? It's um. That's why I give people real money. <laughs> so this is an example of an SPT Ethereum derived CLI. And it's just built right on top of SBT Ethereum. So the way that the CLIs work, if you build them, it's a Scala thing. I'm not expecting very many people to be interested in building them. But the cool thing about it is you end up with a command line that's still, um, still your usual, this is my main world. I have a lot of addresses. <laughs> um, you, you have everything that's in SBT Ethereum, but you add extra commands. So I added something called quip list because it's annoying to have to go through with each transaction view, to have to go through each one, one at a time. So here's quip list. And I changed the indexes to be human friendly from one to nine rather than zero to eight. Um, and so these are the quips that you guys have done. Okay. Awesome. Try it one more time. All right, I'm very glad to do that. There we go, right? So now we have some, some quips. Now, the last thing that we need to do, if you, you guys can do this uh, rather than, I think we're, you've, got, you've been very patient and I feel like I probably shouldn't get you guys to download this client and run it yourself. You can, it's the same way that you did ETH command line, right? You just clone this, um, Git project and then run SBT from inside of it and you get the same, it's the same SBT Ethereum command line with some extra commands added. That's what the CLIs are. You can just add extra commands basically to make things more user friendly. But what you guys should do, if you don't mind, those of you who have been able to run transactions just in your own world, use ETH transaction invoke and then there's the vote function. I'm sorry, it's, we need the quip is the contract and then there's vote, and then vote accepts an index, um, and um, when you type in your index, for the, for the CLI, I made them human-friendly indices, beginning with one, but you should vote for them by subtracting one, right? So, um, thousand, the, the first one that's one would be zero, the second one that's two would be one, Right. In the CLI, they're human-friendly indices, but when you're working directly with the smart contract, Solidity is a zero-indexed language. So, the, so just subtract one from these indices that you see to get your actual index, right? So it, get quip one up here gave us the horses for courses. That's two here. So vote for quips that you like, because after you're done voting for quips, I promise to give you guys some money. We'll see how that works out. <laughs> but it's no, if nobody votes for quips, then the money will just come back to me because I've already voted for my demo quips. So, so it's going to be like this. It's going to be ETH transaction invoke, right? So you did ETH transaction vote, vote in order to set your quips. So then you type V for vote, tab complete. If you give it a space, you can see that what it wants is an index. And so, you know, if you want to vote for what in this list is number seven, type six. You have to subtract one. Oh, okay. Right. So I'm going to give you guys all a few minutes to vote. Um, and then we will do the great lottery. Can you one vote per address? Um, yes, each address gets one vote. You can re-vote if you want to. You can vote as many times as you want, but there's only one vote yeah, per address. Right? Okay. But the command is each. Each shoebox back up. Um, and you can do things like 
Um, well, this is, I'm just going to type it in. You can drag directories into here and stuff as long as you don't end up with spaces. Um, so this is users, temp user, I think is what I called this guy. Um, so use this as a default backup, sure. Okay, so now it is dumping my shoebox. Right, so now if I look in my temporary, my, this is my fresh user, if I look in its home directory, you'll see that I have this long backup. Right, so it's a good idea as soon as you start you know, actually using this and having value that you care about, um, you want to make these backups and keep them. It's also very easy to restore them. Ideally, you put them in some well-defined directory, not your home directory. Right, so SBT Ethereum keeps track of a default backup directory for you, and it makes it really easy. If I want to go back to an old, to an old um, version, it's just each shoebox restore, search default backup directory. Yes, that's the most recent one. It's the only one now. If there were more of them, I could type no, and I could pick. If I wanted to go back further, I could choose which one. It's very interactive about stuff like this. Um, but it's shutting down my current installation and it's restored it. When it restores it, all of a sudden, it doesn't back up the compilers that it downloaded. So it asks you if you want to re-download the compiler, and I do. So that was just a backup and restore right there. Um, so yeah, so the directories, when you want to update versions, you can just delete that eth command line directory and um, Download the one, the next version's one, right? If you remember when we did git clone, we put in the version number of a branch. Or if you think that's you know stupid and overkill, the place that it actually lives is in that eth command line directory. There's a file called projects uh, plugins.spt, and this is where the version is, right? So the next version will be a minor release fixing my stupid parser mistakes, and it will be 0.33 within a day or two, um, and you just update that. And um, yeah, I'm gonna downgrade just so that you see that it works. So if I say downgrade this to 0.3.0, and then I run this, again, it doesn't matter if I run it as SPT or SPTW like this, you'll see that when it initializes, So there's 0 0.3.0 from a few days ago. Um, other things kind of nice to know are there's this file called um, spt ethereum.log and it keeps a record of most of what happened. So you have that too. Um, okay, so have, has anybody who wants to vote voted? Trying to set a new sender. Uh oh. Okay, sir. So let's go through that again. So, if so, okay. So what you you've created a new address for yourself, okay, right? Are, are you are you you're trying to vote twice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. So it's ETH. It's going to be ETH address, and you can just do override because it's the most common one. So I've made sender the so you can do ETH address override, and if I say you know testing five instead of testing zero, which is my usual address, right? Now, that's my sender, and now I can start doing stuff. Right? Yeah, all right, now I'm cheating. Awesome, so you voted, have you voted for yourself? Yeah. Okay, so everybody who wants to vote for themselves, go ahead and do it. I'm very proud of you for going through the commands. It's, you know, it, this is all in the name of education. Yeah, yeah exactly, yes. And again, you know, you can get in touch with me as Interfluidity and direct messages on Twitter. You can get in touch with me on GitHub with issues. You can get in touch with me by email. Or my favorite thing is you can write questions on Stack Overflow because that helps get other people interested too. And there's an SBT Ethereum tag. I will help you so fast on this stuff because I am so lonesome having <laughs> spent like three years writing this software that only I use. So um, if you are interested, you will get fast and easy help. It, exactly, it gets uh, its own state space, and um, 
So let's see. If we go to the quip, let's see if we can find it here. Um, this is that address. Um, so I need to search by that. And um, here we are. Transactions contract. Do they not have? Some of them have um, space browsers, or at least they used to. Yeah, like that, would, that would let you show them, that would let you show the state associated with the contract. Uh -huh. um, I don't know whether EtherScan offers it. EtherCamp used to offer that. Um, but there is a there, the address is associated with the state. The quips. If we look, uh, let me show you. Yeah. Well, it's here. Um, if we look at it's ethquip source main solidity. It's going to show you some sort of representation of the try. Oh no, it's not. It, it won't show you the representation of the try. What they used to show you, the state lives in slots. Right. So the state of this thing, you can. Oh, let's get it syntax highlighted and bigger. We're putting it on the screen. Is that big enough to see? Okay. And then let's do a little bit of, oh, Jesus. Yeah, this is like trying to reach through the source code for the gap code. It's like, it's just referencing stuff that's like not really where anywhere else in the contract. Well, let's, let's look at it. If I can make this big, I will try. Is that big enough to read? Yeah, that's big enough to read. Okay, so this is the source code for this contract. Um, okay, and I, within a couple minutes, we'll talk this through for a minute and then we'll do the payout. So some of you hopefully get some money. Um, and, um, and then we can, I'm glad to stay for however long. But at the top of this contract, you can see these are the state variables. Um, and so they all have, there's a, the, the address space of Ethereum is literally basically like a list of slots okay. in a 256-bit inch address space. Okay. And so the arrays are, these are dynamic arrays. So they are actually pointers um, to somewhere in that address space. And then the elements in the array are linked one by one. Smaller things like uh, a regular string or int or whatever just in the order that they're declared, get slots one after the other. So basically, because these are dynamic and large things, each one of those, the first with their five slots, the first five slots there are basically going to be headers that point somewhere out into the address space for where those things are. Right. Now, yeah, so those are the five data structures that are being used here. And how that's encoded into the tree, logically, it's just this flat, giant address space. And sometimes you need to care about that as a Solidity developer, as a smart contract programmer. How that's encoded onto the tries, I don't know, but I suspect it's as simple as using the index of the slot. There are slots going from zero to very large. Um, and I suspect it's as simple as using those indices um, in byte format as the keys of the try, it's a try data structure, and then attaching the values at the end. I suspect it's just as simple as that. Basically, it's just contract like occupying five address spaces because you have five variables. Yeah, it's. I mean, it has it has five immediate slots, and then it has things further out in its address space, all of the quips and things. Those are all under right the try data structure lets you go from, this is the private address space of this contract. So in the Ethereum world state, at the top level, there are the addresses. So the contract address, we go to the contract address, and then we have the private address space, and it starts from zero to n, and it's, you know, zero is the header to quips, and one is the header to quippers, and so on, and then there are pointers to other numbers way out there in the address space. And then, you know, the strings themselves are dynamic, so those are pointers to eventually you get to the characters and whatever. Um, but, so the, but the programming model is much easier. The, you know, things to notice about the code, 
it's good practice in Solidity to make sure that all of your mutable changes are reflected in logged events so that you can reconstruct the history of what happened. Right? So every mutation is fully described with an event. So the, all of any, the things that you can do to this thing, you can vote, you can add a quip, or you can make a payout. All of those things that make changes are reflected by events. And all of the functions that make changes, the mutators, emit events. So you can always recover the history of what happened from the event stream. And the event stream you're allowed to query for free. So um, it's, it's really good practice to make sure that you log everything as events. Um, so um, if, you, if you submitted quips, quips or votes, you saw SBT Ethereum, here let's do that really fast. If we, I'm gonna vote for somebody's, I uh, just did vote for somebody's quip. What happened to that? Here it is, right? So when that vote was made, SBT Ethereum, if it knows the API, it knows how to interpret the events, and says, okay, so you voted. Um, this was the voter. This was the quipper who I voted for. It was quip index seven. And that was the quip pretty booms. Yeah. Okay. So let's do some paying out now. Hopefully everybody who's wanted to cheat has cheated. Um, and um, let's see how this goes. So I am going to do, so I have die. So now for ERC20 tokens, the first thing that you really need to do when you're working with ERC20 tokens is you, you need to, if, if something like a smart contract is going to spend them on your behalf, you have to approve that. So I'm going to do that first. I'm going to, I have 27. I'm going to go ahead and give all 27. So it's ERC20, is it approve? Allowance set, that's what I call it. Allowance set, and it's for the smart contract quip. Um, I have too many addresses, but okay, this is the approved address. So that's, I started out the wrong way, right? Tab completion when you don't have 111 aliases is helpful because it tells you what you want. Okay, so that is what I want. The first thing is the contract address, that's die. The second one is the approved address. So that's the quip contract. I want the quip contract to be able to pay out from my cache of die. And the third is going to be the number of tokens, and I'm going to say 27. Yeah, no, let's let's start that over. Let's be clear about that. So I am this is this is my sort of default account. This guy here. Uh, he, Oh, look, I'm not even, it wouldn't have worked because I was messing around. I'm not in my default account. ETH address. So let's look at something. ERC um, 20, and it's going to be something like balance. And I'm going to say die. And by default, that's going to be the current account. And I don't have any because I'm not in the account I thought I was in. So I want to go back to the account that I want to be in. I'm just going to um, override into it my default sender. Um, now if I do ERC20 um, balance for die. Now this, I'm typing in DAI like it's something special, like it's a keyword or something. It's not, it's just an address alias. It's just convenient for the ERC20 token to use the tickers as aliases for their addresses, right? So the same way as we said an address alias quip for the quip smart contract, I set the address alias die for the DAI contract, DAI. Um, I looked it up on Etherscan, um, I imported the ABI, and I gave the address the alias DAI. So the ERC, my ERC20 in this account, which is my main sort of test and play account, is 27 DAI, right? So from this account, it was important that I call, I can go ahead and check right now, ERC20, and it is um, allowance print, and it's going to want the first to be die. And then the spender is going to be quip. Um, what else does it want? Oh, no, OK. So it wants from me. So that's the fault sender. It'll, be, it'll look better on yours because you don't have all those aliases. OK, so here. The balance, the allowance that's currently set for that token, for DAI, um, for the use by the quip contract, right now has an allowance of zero tokens. 
Now I'm going to set its allowance. So I'm going to do allowance set. And it's from the sender, from the account that's sending, my default sender. It's going to be die to the spender quip. And it's going to be 27 die. And I'm going to say yes. I think I overly worn in that. OK. OK. Um, so now I have submitted a transaction, and I have to wait for it. So OK, so now we've approved. If we do that balance check again, so for die default sender to quip, right? we now have this approval of up to 27. So now I'm going to do my payout. So it is ETH. I'm going to, because I, I don't want things to take long to mine, I'm going to do a gas override again, gas price override. Um, and I'm going to do it at 50% markup from the default price. Um, and I'm going to do ETH transaction invoke. Oh, uh, but I have to do, now I'm working directly with a smart contract. I want to like try sending five die to the winner, whoever the winner turns out to be. Um, but when I'm working directly with a smart contract, if I just send five, I'm sending five times 10 to the negative 18 die. I'm sending effectively nothing, right? So what I'm going to do in order to figure out what I have to type into the smart contract is this convert tokens to atoms for die, and I want to convert five tokens to atoms. So that's how much I'm going to have to type. That's going to be ETH transaction invoke quip payout. The payout, the first thing that it wants, yeah, I'm going to say yes and scroll up. It wants a token of type address, so that's going to be die. And then the second thing that it wants is an amount. And I just computed that amount here for $5 worth of die, five die in human standards. And let's try it. Oh, so the whether or not the transactions, your conversations with the node go through SSL depends completely on how the node is set up. The node is just an HTTP API. You can do it in the clear or you can do it over SSL. Yeah, no, so the, the voting function, let me show you what that looks like. So the payout is we, it has a, um, here's the payout function. Here's the do payout. So we have a list of quippers um, up there. And what do we do? Uh, no, this is just the payout part. Payout. OK, draw quipper. That's where we're doing the, the randomness. Here's the draw quipper function. This is using, it's called shitty random because it's using randomness from the blockchain, pseudo randomness from blocks, which you shouldn't use for high stakes purposes. But it's generating from prior block hashes a big quasi-random number, which is fine for this low stakes application, but shitty if you were doing something where the stakes were going to be high so that miners might try to game it. So we take a big random number, we mod it by the length, and we choose a voter. Okay. Voters are only allowed to have one vote to equip. Um, so once we, once we have the voter, oh, OK, and so that's probably, um, well, no, I'm not sure. Not sure why it failed. Um, I want to, okay, look, as far as Etherscan is concerned, it has succeeded. Let's see, I'm not sure why it seemed to mine, but said fail. I've never seen that. Let's see what my balance is of die. Okay, still 27, so that's not, well, it could have gotten sent back to me, though, because I'm one of the... Let's do this again. Another $5. And while we're doing it again, while it's mining, let's look into... So according to Etherscan, here's a payout. Oh, no, this is a voting transaction. Okay, so that was somebody else's. That, that's why... Yeah, so this is a transaction that failed. 
Um, I don't know why, but now we're in agreement. It failed. What's that? Um, there might be, but if there is, I don't know how to do it right now. Um, here's the transaction. Click to see more. Um, click to see yes. We go to input data. Um, I would just like to, you know, see one of you walk away with my die. Um, Uh, so what have I done wrong? So there's my. The last one, I mean, you've done it twice now. The second one failed. As well. Yeah, I failed the same way. So it's not a great sign. Let me make sure. I need to allow. So the token address is die. And then the next, I hate my too many things. Token owner address is me. And. The last thing has got to be, I could have just gotten the allowance confused. Um, allowed address should be quip. And an allowance of 27 tokens, which is 27,000 atoms has been approved. So why is it failing? Um, I swear I did try it. It seemed to work a couple of times. Um, so I am trying to ask Quip to make the payout of die, and that many. Um, I have no idea why it's failing. We we can do that. Let's let's go ahead and do that. Um. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, you're right. It says contract out of gas. The problem is a contract out of gas. You don't know that it's out of gas, but let's try that. Even though um, um, each transaction gas limit override, same as before, and I'm not gonna. I'm going to give it a hundred double the gas that it estimates it's supposed to use. Um, okay, and let's try that. Okay, that's the right sender. Okay, let's see what happens. Oh, that worked. Good call. Thank you, Jeff. That was awesome. So, who wrote the quip? Oh, fuck. I wrote that quip. <laughs> So it actually the quip the quipper is me. So if I look at my ERC twenty balance, I still have twenty. So let's do that again now that we know what the issue was. I would really like to give away some of my you know hard earned die here. So let's see if we can get it to go to somebody. It's randomly. It's not picking the one with the most votes. It's just randomly. It's it's yeah it's it's uniform among the votes, oh. right? So whichever quips that have more votes are more likely to be chosen. Oh, uniform random amongst the votes, not the highest, not the highest votes. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Still random. Yeah. Okay. So Which this one? is a different quipper. This is. SPT awesome. SPT. Who wrote the quip? SPT awesome. Always oh, raise your hand. Well, uh, maybe it could be someone who's already left. Um, nobody here? Okay, well, let's do it again. See if we can get it to one of you. So whoever wrote the Quip SPT Awesome, they have, you know, $5 in die. So write that in the comments. I know the suspense is killing me. <laughs> Still, why are you to some of getting used? You submit them to some kind of, you know, open source project? What's that? Why do you say that for three years you were uh, well, I mean, I'm, as far as I know, I'm the only active user of this software. I hope to recruit others. That's, you know, why I'm here. But, um, I mean, a few people, you know, there have been some people who've, you know, written up. 
Okay. All right. So can you go ahead and check your ERC20 balance of die? So the die contract address, let me make that available to you because you'll need that to check your balance. Um, here it is. I'm going to put that on our little issues communication page. Guys, I want a contract, huh? um, yes, every ERC20 token is just a contract. It's just a contract that keeps track of balances and transfers. That's basically it. So if you, it's ERC20 balance and then paste in this address. If you want to, you can give this address to alias die. I'll show you how to do that too. You should have balance, so capital B tab, yep, and then just paste in that address and hit return because it's your, as long as your, your current sender is the um, one that you used. Do you have a balance? So that is not really an official like uh, token, it's just something that you created for this contract, right? No, die, die is the, it's yeah, it's the, the most, yeah. Five die. Awesome. There you go. For some other. Uh, so the main place you use, although as a gentleman pointed out, it's hazardous. But the most common thing to do is, you know, you look it up on EtherScan or something, right? So, but that does mean that EtherScan, because it's become such a central an authoritative source of information about the Ethereum ecosystem, it is a significant point of failure. So there are, you know, projects out there, Swarm is one that apparently some progress has been made on. It was talked about at DevCon, but I haven't read about it. Swarm and things like IPFS, people are trying to figure out more decentralized ways of getting meta information out there and published. Um, actually, there's already a standard format when you compile a a solidity contract, there's a standard piece of metadata that it generates with the intention that it would be exist on some decentralized network so that people could look up the information about the contract generated, you know, by whoever compiled it and signed and it would be on Swarm or something. But for now, it's mostly, mostly Etherscan for right. better, for probably for worse. I see. Got it. Um, oh, so let's do that one more time. And, um, and then, you know, you guys are free. I'm happy to hang out as long as you want to, but I, I, just, I feel like this. Oh, let me, t let me show you. So you, that die, when you get an alias and you just want to set it to something, right, it would be eth address alias set and then die and then that number, the hex address. I'm not going to do it because I already have it. Here, I'll, I'll actually do it in my, in my fresh environment. Um, but it's very convenient when you're working with the RC20 contracts, use the quote ticker symbol as the alias and then all the commands are very convenient. Um, address alias set, what am I doing wrong? address and it's not working for me again this might be me having messed up the parsers last night but. oh it wants an extra it is it's it's this parser issue it wants an extra white space because I messed with the parsers and so it wants two spaces this is the thing that is haunting us today that I messed with how it deals with spacing, and sometimes it expects two spaces. But can you, do you just, you know, it says give space, give space, so it doesn't matter how much spaces you give, it will just deal with the one. Yeah, so it's, I, it's, uh, it's, if I was writing it in ordinary code, I would certainly just be trimming the spaces. Um, the, the problem, you know, just to make it clear how ridiculously my fault it all is, is that 
in order to do the tab completion, SPT has a very rich library of parsers. So I specify for each of these commands a set of parsers that parses the arguments, and I specify how I want it to tab complete. Um, and early on, there's a built-in parser into SPT called space. And I took it to mean one space character, and so I kept doing things like space dot splat or space dot plus, right? If you're familiar with like regexes, this means zero or more, one or more. It turns out that the space is already plus. So the parsers were overly complex and perform poorly and don't tab complete well. And so over time, I've been trying to remedy my misunderstanding and get rid of the pluses and figure out exactly where the spaces need to go. It's not, I'm not reading strings and then parsing and trimming them myself. I'm using this library. And the library is very good. It, I hated it for a long time because it never seemed to work right. I was always kind of experimentally messing with things and it wasn't working the way that I thought. And I thought it was just kind of a flaky library and I, I just did my best to make it work. And then I realized it was because I just had a fundamental misunderstanding about what one of the basic primitives were. And so I'm slowly unwinding that over time and redoing the parsers to be correct rather than just experimentally working. But as you can see, there are um, glitches. There, it was, well, in SPT, there is documentation, but you spend a lot of time in the source code, too. So yeah. um, but it's a, it's, it's a wonderful and a terrible little platform. Um, I kind of love it now, but most people hate it when they first encounter it because it's complicated. Um, but so, yeah, so this will work. ETH address alias set right now is working. Um, Um, you know, and I'll just give, give this another name, but you have to tab complete to a second space and then you can paste in an address. Um, obviously, I will fix that. It's terrible. <laughs> but there it is. Um, um, so I'm going to drop the, this JK, whatever. Um, and Right, you can always see the aliases that you've set, although I also want to make that formatted a little bit more nicely than this arrow format. I want to put it in a tabular format. Um, but these are the aliases that are currently set. So, um, oh, so this, while we were talking, I think I was paying somebody else out, was I? Oh, no, I wasn't. I was, I was getting flustered by the fact that it didn't work. Okay, so let's send out another five bucks to somebody. And then we'll end the formal engagement, I guess. I know the suspense. Totally killing me. Okay. Oh. I paid myself again. Oh, you paid yourself. Nice. Yes. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, no, it, I, it, it comes right back. I, it's just, uh, I, I, I got to write the four cents, the gas cost, but that was all. Um, okay. Yeah, change your vote. Don't vote for, don't vote for me, because that's boring. So I'll, I'll wait till the votes are changed, and then I'll I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see the winning quip. It is. Dun dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. We need to embed the drum roll sound effect in the mining yeah. wait period. <laughs> What's that? I have to see what these lottery answers. Oh, the lottery look, these answers, yeah. All right. Nice. This is not a test. Whose quip is that? All right. There you go, Christian. Woo! <laughs> All right. I voted for I put up five quips in there. I had, I'm glad somebody found the voter for All right. 
Um, okay, well, I think that ends the formal as much as this was formal. I'm hanging out. Anyone wants to chat? I'm glad to chat. Thank you so much. So, guys, in this is like uh, our longest formal one, other than like a half day event. But this is like great, you know. This is, this is like this is better than this is engaging. Great stuff. Thank you so much for putting up with it. Maybe you can return in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't feel very welcome here. So. <laughs> <laughs>